All right, we got Marilyn coming in. This is uh, Brother David Paul's wife-to-be, his fiance. If you're just joining us now, Facebook, YouTube, we thank you for joining us. We are live recording. We have our brothers and sisters from Pakistan and India. How we doing, sister? God bless you. Welcome. Welcome to this study. Um, so if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, because we're recording right now, know that this is a worldwide Bible study. We're trying to get people from all over the world on this to really discuss the things that pertain to the church right now. Um, the church is in a warfare. We're fighting a, we're fighting a war right now. This is not a time to be passive. This is not a time to be uh, uh, scared and fearful. This is a time to be really ready and on your guard and also being able to be used by God himself. You want to be able to be used by God himself. You want him to work through you for the sake of others. It's very important that we know that, that God, the Lord wants to use all of us, no matter where we're at. So he's going to cleanse us and he's going to refine us and he's going to prune us. It don't feel good to the flesh, but it is the process. We can't skip that process. And uh, we're going to go right into today's teaching. I'll do a share screen here and we'll go right into it today. Everybody looks good. Everybody looks healthy. God bless all of y'all. Everybody looks good. All right. We're going to share screen here. All right, guys. And we're going to go right into today's teaching. Let's do that here. Okay, let me let me pull up my screen over here. All right. I'll come right over here. All right. Perfect. All right. There we go. All right, guys. So we're going to do a little review from the first from the first weeks. All right. We're on week two of this teaching here. All right, we're on week two of this teaching here. I want everybody, if they can, if you can put a thumbs up, all right, or just put a thumbs up on your screen if you see this screen here. Okay, cool, all right, got my wife. Marilyn, you see the screen there, good? See the screen, awesome. Good, 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 good. All right, and as we'll let other people in, we'll let others in eventually, all right, as it goes on. So this is the teaching here, all right? Marilyn, your husband is jumping on the line. <laughs> it's good to say that, man. It's good. It's good. It's good to see God bringing people together, man. It's good to see the Lord bringing people together. Praise God. Praise God. So we're going to let we're going to let David Paul in. He should be coming in any minute. Praise the Lord. Yeah. All right. Let me drop it down here. There we go. There we go. Perfect. All right. So let's start it out here. We're just going to be doing a little bit of a, a recap. All right, guys. Well, we know that this series is called The Devil Wears Unmasking Temptation Week 3. All right. We're going to do a little recap for the first two weeks. See where we've been, where we're going. All right. We see here we're going to go right through these slides quickly. Bear with me and pay close attention. Let's review our first two weeks briefly and see how we have been unmasking temptation thus far. We see how the serpent tempted Eve with the same method we read in 1 John 2.16. Okay, so we see how the enemy, the serpent, tempted Eve in the garden, basically telling her, and we'll read it from Genesis 3.6, when the woman, Eve, so that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. The same tactics the serpent used in the garden were the same tactics he used in the wilderness against the Lord Jesus. And we're going to go into that a little bit later during this teaching on how he came the same way with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. From the garden all the way to the wilderness, from the garden of Eden all the way to the wilderness, okay? 
He's used the same type of temptations to get Eve to fall, which he succeeded, okay? He succeeded getting Eve to fall, but then he tried the same thing with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he did not succeed, which he was unsuccessful. He did not succeed. So he, you know, that that's our hope there. If the Lord, if the Lord actually, if the Lord actually did not succeed, we would be in big trouble right now. Okay. The serpent's temptation in the garden, the lust of the flesh, the tree was good for food, the lust of the eyes, and pleasing to the eye. Okay. So the lust of the flesh, the tree was good for food. Okay, the lust of the eyes and pleasing to the eye. This is how he came to Eve. It was the tree was good for food. It was pleasing to the eye. And then the pride of life. It was also desirable for gaining wisdom. These temptations are the same way. Okay, he's not changing his tactics. He's not changing his tactics. These temptations are the same way he's coming against all humanity, especially believers in Jesus Christ. In these last days, the devil isn't going to change his methods of attack on those that hold fast to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Let's observe how he used three specific temptations against God himself in the flesh. Okay, guys, let's see that. This is Jesus in the wilderness, all right? This is Jesus in the wilderness, okay? Brother David, you hear me? Brother David? Okay, well, we're going to continue here. It says, then Jesus, this is Matthew 4, 1 through 4, okay? It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, so he was hungry. He was hungry. Jesus was hungry. He was fasting and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And look how Jesus answered. It is written. It is written. He used the scripture when temptation came against them through the enemy's hand. Second one, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay, so remember what Jesus is doing. The devil's tempting him, and Jesus is using the scripture. It is written. That's very important for us nowadays. And the last one, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. So this is Satan himself telling God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the son of God, that if he will worship him, if the son of God, God himself, think about this, that if God will worship Satan, he'll give him all the kingdoms of the world. Okay, if you will bow down and worship me, this is what the devil is saying to Jesus Christ. Jesus said to him, this is what Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the, the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. So it's very important. Jesus was tempted three times in three ways. And we're going to see that right here. This is Matthew 4, 1 through 11, what we all just read together. The three temptations from the garden. Okay, let me go back here. From the garden to the wilderness is the same thing. He's doing the same thing to us. Remember, if he did it to Eve, 
if he did it with Adam and he did it with the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to do it to us. Remember, the servant's not greater than his master. If he came at Jesus the same way, he's going to use the same tactics. That's why it's very important to understand the spiritual realm, how it operates, how Satan operates against us. We don't glorify Satan. We don't put him on a pedestal. He, he is a defeated foe, but we do have to fight him. We see Apostle Paul say that he does not fight against flesh and blood, that we don't fight against flesh and blood. Apostle Paul's life was a life of spiritual warfare, and he was an anointed man, and the devil was defeated, but you see how he still was around the earth causing havoc. You see that, and we have to understand how he's operating. So you see in the three temptations here in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, the lust of the flesh, okay, tell these stones to become bread. This is what Satan told Jesus. That's, that, that comes at the lust of the flesh. Tell these stones to become bread. The lust of the eyes. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. He's tempting the Lord himself. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. The lust of the eyes. And then the pride of life. Then the pride of life. Again, this is we're reading from Matthew 4. The pride of life. Look at how he comes at him against. Look at how he comes at him with the pride of life. Again. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Okay, so he showed him everything that the world offers us as human beings in our natural eye, what we see, the pleasures of the world, the pleasures of life, materialism, power, popularity, all this. This is what the devil is telling the Lord Jesus Christ. All this I will give you. He said, if you will bow down and worship me. So what is the devil looking for? He's looking for worship. Satan in this generation right now is looking for worship. He wants all worship because he's trying to be like God himself. And he'll come at us with these three. Whatever you take away from this teaching, analyze this on your own time. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we're going to go deeper into this on the next slide. All the previous slides, everything that we just passed and we just talked about, it went through the point, it's pointing through the main idea of this teaching. Okay, so we, we're trying to come, we're trying to bring it all together right now for everybody, even ourselves, those that are teaching this, myself included. Now more than ever, now more than ever, we are to be on guard against temptation coming in through three entry points. Okay, remember, we are doing all this together to understand. We're doing all this teaching, and we're pointing all these things out, how the devil deceived Eve and how he came against Jesus Christ in the same way in the wilderness. And he's going to do the same thing with us. It's no, it's no different. And we want to know how that's coming in against us. Last week, in week two, we see that the lust of the eyes usually comes first, followed by the pride of life. This doesn't have to be the usual order. So there's not a particular order, everyone, how the enemy's tempting you. Sometimes he'll use the lust of the flesh. He'll use the lust of the eyes. He'll use the pride of life. It doesn't have to be in a particular order. This doesn't have to be the usual order. Temptation tries to come into your life, but most of the time, it usually is. So he'll usually use what we want with our eyes, and then we want, we desire to get it. Very, that's one of the easiest entry points. We seen last week that the lust of the eyes stimulates a fleshly response. The lust of the eyes, when we desire something with our eyes, it stimulates our carnal nature because we're human beings. We, especially men, we, we have an image. We, we look at things and that, that translates into our mindset, how we think or what we think about. And it's the same thing that can happen to women as well. We see something we like or we want or desire to do, then we act it out. Let's look at how James describes this, okay? James describes this very well. James 1, 13 through 15. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. 
Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. James confirms that it starts with our own desires. That's where it starts. It starts with our desires. But if our desire, look at this. This is where we shift. This is how we grow in the spirit. If our desire is to do the will of God, we will have victory over temptations when it comes knocking at our doorstep. That is the key right there. Our desire to do the will of the Father and to follow Jesus Christ, to take up our cross and follow him daily, has to overshadow our own desires. That's it right there. That's it right there. It's not saying that your, your fleshly or carnal desires are going to just go away. They're not. You're going to fight that because we're in this flesh. But if our desires are to do the will of God and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ daily, we're going to be able to overcome temptation when it comes against us. Because our desire is to follow Christ. Our desire is to follow Jesus. That's it. Once again, and this is a warning for all of us, myself included, once again, beware. The lust of the eyes will give way to works of the flesh. So once we're looking at something we want, we desire, what happens is we, put, we have to put it, what we desire, into practice. The lust of the, lust of the eyes will give way to works of the flesh. Because you have to put what you desire or want into practice. You have to do something physically to get what you want. And this is what Galatians 6, 7, 8 says. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. This is what I was saying before. Okay, this is what I was saying before. Whoever sows to their flesh will reap destruction, but whoever sows to their spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. That is important. If our desire is to do the will of God, if our desire is to do the will of God, we are going to, we're going to overshadow the desire of the flesh. We're going to overshadow that desire. It is not going to overtake us. This is Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Galatians 5, 19, 21. The acts of the flesh. This is, these are things that we put into practice when we desire something. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when the lust of the eyes overtakes us, we usually have a, have a response in our flesh. If we're weak from, for the, against the lust of the eyes, we're going to actually act out something in one of these. So there's an order to all this. This is how the spiritual world operates. That's why your eyes, your ears, what you, what you see, what you listen to, okay, affect your mind. It affects you. That's why it's very important as the people of God now that we, we, censor what we watch and what we listen to very important because if we fall to the lust of the eyes we're going to be practicing one of these it's going to be put into practice let's understand that in the last days we're living in the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh are being attacked more intensely because the enemy's time is short all right the enemy's time is short He's using our environments and desires, okay? So the environment can actually be the internet. It's very easy to fall on in the internet. Very easy, okay? What we put our eyes to on the internet, what we put our eyes to what we, when we watch movies and these type of things. And he's coming very hard against this. He's coming hard against this, against the eyes, against what we watch, 
He is coming very hard, okay? He's using our environments and desires together, okay? So our desires and our environments, he's using that together to entice us to sin against the Lord. All he's trying to do is entice us. Remember, temptation is not sin, but yielding to it is. So being tempted is not, it's not sinful. You're not committing sin, but falling to it, it is. That's why it's always around us every hour of the day. And it's not only sexual sin. I'm, we're going to go through other sins that the enemy tries to wage against us if he can't tempt us to sin outside of our body or, excuse me, I should say, sin against our bodies. Whether it is to tempt us to sin, okay, against our bodies, against our own bodies through sexual sin, or tempting us through our minds or emotions, all right? If he can't, if he can't get us to sin against our own bodies, what he'll do is he'll tempt us through our minds and our emotions by deceiving us to hold on to anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness. The battle is intensifying all around us. So these three right here, anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness, those are sins that people hold on in their heart that are really not seen by everybody. They're not seen really by any human being. Only God himself knows who, who has that living in them. And this will block the anointing of God. This will block the blessings of God in your life, the anointing, the spiritual growth, your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness will block you. It'll block you from the blessings of heaven. It'll actually, it'll, it'll really dry out your spiritual life. So if he can't get you to commit sexual sin through your body, he'll come against you by causing others to sin against you so you can be bitter, angry, or unforgiving. He'll even try to get you to be unforgiving against God because God allows temptation in our life. He allows it. Why? Because that's how he, he prunes us and refines us. So we can be more, we can be more spiritual people that we're not living in the flesh. The only way to get stronger in the faith is through resistance. There's no other way to do it. You're not going to get stronger in your faith without resistance. It's like going to the gym and just walking around doing 10 pound weights, doing five pound weights. Yeah, you might feel something, but now all of a sudden you move to 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 pounds. That's a different resistance. But over time, you're going to get stronger. It's going to build muscle. It's the same way in the spiritual realm. It's the same way with our spiritual growth. It's the same way as we walk this out, this journey out with the Lord himself and we follow him. The serpent and his temptations. The cravings of the body, sexual temptations. The emotions, negative feelings. Holding on to offense. That's a big one now. Holding on to offense. Unforgiveness. Rage and anger. False religion. Okay? He comes in as an angel of light and his ministers as messengers of righteousness. That's what Paul says. The enemy comes in like an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. So you will not be able to pick them out right away. You need discernment in this generation. Jesus did say in Matthew 24, be aware that many false prophets are rising up. See, that's why, you know, I really, I really believe and I'm not trying to make a judgment call on people's ministries and churches, but I really believe we don't hear things like this because this challenges people. You don't get a bunch of amens. You don't get a bunch of clappy and yay, hallelujah. It, it really focuses you. To, these teachings focus you to examine yourself. But these are the teachings that make that help you grow in the spirit. They help you grow in the faith. Because if you examine yourself daily, okay, if you examine yourself daily, you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life and make the changes that he wants to make. Remember, this following Jesus has nothing to do with works, has nothing to do with that. We can't work our way. We can't work our way to please God. We can't work. We have to surrender. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and govern our life. We have to allow the Lord to be the Lord over our life. And not try to think because we're doing works that we're serving God. Sometimes, like, like I was telling Vikash earlier, our brother from India, sometimes God will put you in a place where he wants you to be still. And he wants you to minister unto him. And don't do nothing but pray 
read your Bible and worship me. That's it. But some of us are wired to do, 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 do. I got to do something. And he's saying, don't do nothing. Just be still and know that I'm God. And he's done it to all of us. And if you're in that season, rest assured, it's a good thing because he's trying to grow you. He's trying to grow you up a little bit. This is a time, this is a sober time. We see COVID-19 killing people. People are going into eternity without knowing Christ. We see people uh, in our own countries, persecution, murder. We see crime increasing, especially in the United States and different cities. This is a very sober time. We need to be spiritually strong. We need to be focused on our father's business. And the only way we can do that is by, he, by him growing us up. We cannot be children anymore being tossed to and fro. That's what the Ephesians 4, 1 says, children being tossed to and fro to grow up. We need to grow up now. And these teachings help you grow up. They don't feel good because they challenge us to examine ourselves, but they will. They will grow us up so that Jesus Christ can trust us with more. He can use us more. He can give us more responsibility and we can bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. There's, there, you know, following the Lord now and being in ministry is not easy. I know some people here are in ministry as well, but it's not easy and we have to grow up. We cannot do, we cannot be babies in the faith no more. So these teachings here, they challenge us. They challenge us to be more spiritual people. They challenge us to walk with Jesus deeply and worship him and love him over our own desires. So look what this says. False religion, all right, the serpent and his the serpent and his temptations, the cravings of the body, sexual, the emotions, negative feelings, holding on to offense, unforgiveness and rage. False religion, even in disguise of Christianity. There's some he's coming against the church. So he's trying he's infiltrated the church. Okay? Some truth mixed with lies. So this is basically how the serpent operates. He comes in very subtly. He comes in very crafty. This is a summary of how the serpent masks his temptations. He wears a cloak of false light and false love, okay, false love to infiltrate the church and believers to fall away from revealed truth. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. What you see now in a lot of ministries and churches that talk about love, 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 love all day, they are unbalanced because there's times where God, he, he disciplines us and he does that because he loves us. He doesn't do that because he doesn't love us, but there's times where he allows hard things in our lives so we can grow like we were talking about earlier. So all this love, all this false love and love this and love that. It's the truth, but it's not the whole truth. We have to preach and teach the full counsel of God, the full counsel, because if not, we're going to be unbalanced in how we walk with Jesus Christ. It's going to be hard to take up that cross. The cross does not feel good all the time. Jesus himself said, if you come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And that was before he went to the cross himself. Our cross sometimes is not easy. Now we're going to go into the dragon. It's a nice picture. <laughs> the dragon, okay? I want to say something about this. If Satan, if Satan cannot deceive you, if Satan cannot deceive you as a serpent and, and make you fall and entice you to sin, he is going to come at you like a dragon. He's going to start persecuting you. That, that dragon is in Revelation 12. We're going to read that now. But he's going to come against you aggressively. Now he's going to really physically come against you. See, the serpent comes in through the side. You can't really see him. Sometimes you don't detect him till later. He comes against your mind. He comes through false religion. Comes through feelings in our body. But then all of a sudden... When he can't get you to fall, he comes against you like a dragon. And we're going to read in Revelation 12 really quickly what the dragon does. Satan comes to you in two ways. He comes to you like a serpent, very subtle, very crafty. But then he comes to you like a fire-breathing dragon that wants to kill you, 
even Jesus himself said, he comes, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came that you might have life and life, ab life in abundance. And this is what we see here, Revelation 12. This is where we see the dragon come on the scene. A great sign appeared in heaven. This is Revelation 12. We're going to go through the whole chapter very quickly. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman. The woman is Israel. The woman is symbolic of Israel. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars of, on her head. The 12 stars are the 12 tribes of Israel. The woman is Israel. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. So Israel gave birth to the Messiah. Then another sign appeared in heaven, pay attention, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven, crown, seven crowns on his head. So that's the governments and that's the world systems of this world. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Okay, so this scripture, this verse, or this chapter goes into when Satan actually deceived the other angels to follow him and they became rebellious angels. The dragon stood in front of the woman. Okay, so look at what he's doing. The dragon stood in front of the woman, the nation of Israel, who was about to give birth. Okay, she was about to give birth to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ, so that it might devour her. All right, so look what, the, look what the dragon was doing. He was in front of the woman to devour her child the moment he was born. Now, I want to make this really quickly, and we should, we should know this as Christians. When Jesus Christ was first born, remember when Herod, he wanted to kill all the children, and he did from two years older and younger because he wanted to kill the Messiah. This is what was happening in the spiritual realm. Revelation chapter 12, directly correlates with what happened when King Herod killed all the kids from two years old down in Judea to try to kill Jesus Christ. Because remember, Israel, which was is the woman, gave birth, which is the, the, the baby that they're describing here, to the Messiah himself. She gave birth to a son, okay, Jesus Christ, a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. So wherever you see this in the scripture, he's going to rule the nations with an iron scepter. They're talking about Christ, the Messiah, the one that's going to rule the world for a thousand years. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. So when Christ, when they killed him and he resurrected, he went straight up to the father. He went right back to where he came from. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for a thousand and two sixty days. The war broke out in heaven. Then war broke out in heaven. Okay, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. There he goes once again. And the dragon and his angels fought back. So we know that the dragon has angels. He has an entourage. He has others fighting with him. But he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was, was hurled down. That ancient serpent, look what, now look at the description. That ancient serpent, ancient, Garden of Eden, called the devil, the slanderer, or Satan, the accuser, who leads the whole world astray. This is, a, this is very, very specific. He leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah, for that's Jesus Christ, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. So he was kicked down out of the second heavenlies. There's three heavens. There's the heavenly throne room, the middle heaven, is where Satan and his angels dwell and the principalities and powers. And then you have the heavens that we can see with our eyes. I, I believe that because Paul talks about that in Corinthians, that he saw a man taken out of his body and he went through, the, he went to the third heavenlies. So if there's three heavens, right? The third heavenlies, 
that means that there has to be another two. It makes a lot of sense there. And we'll continue here. It says, they triumph. They triumph. Okay, they. That's us. All right? The ones who are accused before God by, the, by Satan himself, they triumphed over him. This is us now. By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives. Okay, we did not love our lives. We're not supposed to love our lives so much, so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw, okay, so look at what the dragon's doing. He's looking to destroy and kill and persecute. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half a time. This is a this is a actually a specific time referring to the tribulation, the three and a half years. And that's another teaching in itself. Out of the serpent's reach. Okay, so basically God made a way to care for Israel. Times in a time, times and a half a time. Out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. So you see how this dragon is operating. And the last part of this uh, chapter here. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. The dragon was enraged. So we see what, how the enemy is working here. We see his characteristics as a dragon. The dragon was enraged at the woman, at Israel, and went off to wage war, pay attention, against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. Who is that? Who has a testimony about Jesus? We do. So what, what Revelation 12 reveals here is that the dragon, which is Satan, he's waging a war against God's people, whether it's the nation of Israel or whether it's God's people that came in through Jesus Christ. Okay? Our testimony seals us. Our receiving Christ seals us. But the minute we receive Christ, we are in a warfare against the dragon and his angels. That's what Paul was trying to tell us in Ephesians 6. He was laying out the warfare that we're in. This is this Revelation. I would suggest to read Revelation 12, the whole chapter, yourself and study it because it's very symbolic, but yet it makes a lot of sense. The minute Jesus was born, King Herod wanted to kill him. Who, what did it, what inspired King Herod? It was a demonic spirit, Satan himself. He wanted to kill Jesus Christ as a baby, and he killed all the kids from two years and down. Two years and younger in Judea. You have to be, you have to be an insane murderer to do that. But who's an insane murderer? Satan himself. So what inspired King Herod during Jesus' birth to try to hunt him down and kill him was Satan himself. We read this in Revelation 12. This is what this is referring to. It gives a spiritual panoramic. It gives us what's happening in the spirit while the natural, what's taking place in the natural. There's always a spiritual root to what's happening in the natural realm. Always a spiritual root. Remember that. So you, we read Revelation 12, and we can read Matthew chapter 2 and 3, and we can see how Herod was being inspired by Satan and how this war was happening in the heavenlies while this was taking place in the natural realm. If the serpent can't move you in a subtle way to sin, he will turn into a dragon. It sounds like a fairy tale, right? I was writing this and I was thinking, this is like a fairy tale. But the dragon is real. It's in the Bible. He will turn into a dragon. The dragon is depicted in Revelation 12 as a persecutor of God's people and one who tried to kill Jesus as soon 
as he came out of the womb, eventually, eventually setting his sights on us. He couldn't kill Jesus. So what he did was, as Jesus' ministry grew, as he took his sin, he took our sin upon himself, and he went back to heaven. He ascended up back to heaven after his resurrection. The devil started focusing on us. It started with the apostles, the persecutions of Paul, Peter, and all the apostles. And he hasn't changed his tactic. This is why the Bible is very, it's pattern-oriented. You see the same thing playing out right now. The persecution of the church is increasing. I'm not talking about the compromised church. I'm talking about the true remnant body of Christ that holds to the testimony. The dragon is coming after us because he's been, he's been working as a serpent already. He's been working as a serpent for a very long time. Now he's going to change up to that dragon and he's going to come against us. And we got to be ready for that. The serpent turns into a dragon. Persecution to renounce your faith. As a dragon, he uses threats, force, physical harm, and isolation. Most of these are aimed at us, okay? Most of these things, most of these persecutions are aimed at us, yielding to the pride of life. Following Jesus and believing in the true gospel will cost us physical comforts and sometimes even our lives. So if we have the world in us still and we desire the things of the world, the devil eventually is going to put his finger on that. And even God would allow that because he wants you to give that idol up. And that's what we see happening right now. Even with a vaccine program that is trying to vaccinate the population and those that don't want to vaccinate, well, well, you know what happens to them? They get shamed. They get shamed. They get talked about. The enemy is working a tactic in the world that if you don't go along with the world system and what they say to do, you're going to be ostracized. You're going to be isolated. That's the first. And then eventually forced. And then if you don't want to do it, now we're going to threaten you. And then eventually we'll kill you or we'll beat you to death. This is what's happening right now in our society. Pay attention to what's happening. The dragon is coming back and he's coming back to try to make his last push. Examples of the dragon at work throughout history against God's people. Look at this example here. Rome's persecution of the church in AD 64 to 313. Okay. This is the early church right here. This is the early church. Most of these persecutions the Romans carried out centered on forcing Christians to renounce their faith so they can go back to living in Roman society. So what the Romans were doing was they were throwing Christians into the Colosseum. They were killing their children first at times, killing their loved ones, and then telling them, will you renounce your faith and worship Caesar? Worship Caesar, the emperor, worship Caesar over Jesus Christ, over your God. And everything will go back to the, everything will go back to normal. That's a temptation to renounce your faith. That is a temptation. And that's what the dragon does. He puts you in a corner where now you're being looked, you, you, your choices, your choice right now is either you're going to die or your kids are going to die, your husband, your wife, if you don't renounce your faith. That is how the dragon operates. We're going to look at modern day China, look at modern day China. 2021, this year, all right? So we looked at Rome, 64, after the death of Jesus Christ, 64 to 313, and look at China today, 2021. Bob Fu, Bob Fu is a minister, and he escaped the persecutions of China. Estimates that more than 100,000 churches have been closed. Thousands of pastors and church leaders have been put in jail, and millions of Chinese Christians have been forced to what? to renounce their faith. Right now, this is happening in China. The, the nation of the dragon is ironic, right? That China is known for being the nation of the dragon. And look what, look what they're doing. They're, they're actually, they're actually, they're practicing, they're walking out. They're doing what the dragon does. So look at the spirit behind it. 
Bob Fu, which is a pastor that started a, a he started a nonprofit organization, a ministry to try to t get Chinese Christians out of China. So he has experience with this. Bob Fu estimates that 100,000 churches have been closed. Thousands of pastors and church leaders have been put in jail and millions of Chinese Christians have been forced to renounce their faith and go through brainwashing over the past few years. In churches today, they sing the Chinese national anthem before any worship song is sung. Think about that. They're singing the national anthem of China before they get into worshiping Christ. They're basically trying to tell you that our nation, the Chinese nation, for their citizens, is over Jesus Christ. And we know that that's a lie. This is all done and orchestrated by Satan himself. The minister gives one half of the sermon. So the pastor will preach a half a sermon. And then the second half is given by someone from the Communist Leadership Committee. So they got somebody from the government there to preach the second half of the sermon. And look what he ends with. Caesar, uh, Caesar, Caesar is determined to be lifted up and worshipped on the pulpit. Basically, Caesars were the Roman emperors that was successive during the Roman Empire. They were called Caesars. So he's using that analogy. The Caesar is determined to be lifted up and worshipped on the pulpit. Look at this. Thousands of pastors and church leaders have been put in jail and millions of Chinese Christians have been forced to renounce their faith and go through brainwashing over the past few years. Is the dragon still at work in this day and age, 2021, in China? Absolutely. And he's, he's, he's working and he's heading over to the Western countries, Europe, Canada, and the United States. He is heading over. Oh, let me go back here one. These were just two examples of the dragon at work. One, during the ancient Roman Empire, okay, the other in modern day China. Both persecutions are orchestrated by the dragon to tempt Christians to renounce their faith. These temptations are directly connected to the pride of life. So if you compromise, or renounce your faith, life will go back to normal. You will have the comforts of your life. You will be able to go to work, make money, feed your family. You'll be able to have access to movie theaters and restaurants if you have your vaccine passport. That's where this is coming from. Do not be deceived. All this stuff of control, vaccine passports, and, and tracking mechanisms are all leading back to the dragon's way of eventually telling you, if you do not renounce your faith and follow us, do what we tell you to do. We are going to strip you of your life and eventually kill you. The pride of life is always tempted in this way. This is a major temptation that the enemy uses because he's a dragon as well. You can enjoy the things you once had in life, right? If you compromise or renounce your faith, Life will go back to normal. That's what he presents to you in the middle of this. You can enjoy the things you once had in life. So that's what he's trying to do. And we have uh, people here on, from Pakistan online on this Bible study, and they know about persecution. You have people here in, from India, they know about persecution because persecution there in a Muslim society, basically you cannot even speak about Jesus Christ being the son of God because you have blasphemy laws there. Who do you think put that in place? Who inspired that form of government? The dragon. The dragon inspired that. There's a spirit behind everything that happens in this world and through nations and in nations. There's a spirit behind it. But let's see. Let's see in the next slides what Jesus said about this. How are we supposed to hold up against this type of temptation? We're going to run through this quickly. Mark 8, 35 through 37 says, For so whoever will save his life shall lose it. But so whoever, whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? 
Slide two, Matthew 10, 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my father, which is in heaven. Think of all the hostility Jesus endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not given your lives in your struggle against sin. Hebrews 12, 3 through 4. Realize something. Realize something. Excuse me one second. Realize something, everyone, that we're going to be faced with this again. We're going to be faced with this. We're going to have to make choices when persecution comes. These passages reveal the response we should have in the face of persecution. We are supposed to endure to the end by the grace of God. We want to endure. We want to endure to the end. Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, those that endure to the end shall be saved. Why? Because this was going to come again. This type of persecution is going to ramp up in the last days like we have not ever seen it in history. We are heading into the Antichrist system. The beast system is rising up around us. This is not sensational. This is not trying to scare you. This is not trying to make this teaching sound very, very uh, 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 more spiritual than what it is. But this is what we're seeing right now. And we can ask our brothers and sisters in Pakistan and India what they're going through pertaining to persecution. And in the book of Hebrews, when he wrote this, this was about Jews that were being persecuted by the temple. When they wrote the book of Hebrews, when the author wrote the letter of Hebrews, they still had the temple. It hadn't been destroyed yet. And the Jews were being, those Jewish believers in Christ were being persecuted by the Jews that were still in the temple practicing the Mosaic law. So we see over here in the book of Hebrews how they themselves in the early church, being Jews, had to endure persecution. That's why he says, think of all the hostility that Jesus, he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not given your lives in your struggle against sin. These passages reveal the response we should have in the face of persecution. We are supposed to endure to the end by the grace of God. That is our lot. We are supposed to endure. If the serpent cannot entice you, this is our last slide, everyone. If the serpent cannot entice you, tempt you to sin against your own body, have you hold things against other people, or believe false doctrines, he will change up on you and become that dragon we've read about in Revelation 12. Now, I'm not talking about this in a literal sense. I'm talking in the spirit. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I want to conclude my message for week three. All right, so this is the ending of the message here. And I want you to understand that when we're talking about dragon and all that, it's not a fairy tale. This is a spiritual war. This is a spiritual war. And right now, Satan has came in like a flood, but he's coming in very subtle. He's coming in like that serpent in the garden, telling humanity that they don't need God, that they can be God and make their own decisions, that they can make their own judgments about morality, about good and evil. So he's still doing the same thing, but eventually... He's going to turn into a dragon like we read in Revelation 12 when Jesus was born. He's going to come and be a persecutor of God's people, the church and the nation of Israel. And you see it playing out. We see the serpent at work in our societies, in our nations. If we are paying attention, we have to be paying attention. But soon, but soon, as he knows, but soon as the devil knows, he will not move the remnant church through false doctrine, through the lust of the eyes, or through the lust of the flesh, he will zero in on the pride of life. So he's going to try to come against that. Do we love the world more than Jesus? He's going to come against 
the pride of life through persecution, intimidation, and threats to see if we will pick this world or the kingdom of God. He's going to do it again. He's not going to change, everyone. This is what he does. This is in his nature. He's a, he's a murderer from the beginning. Jesus said that himself. He's going to switch up. That's why all of us have to be ready and we have to train ourselves to stand firm on the persecution, stand firm in the faith, put the armor of God on daily, prayer, fasting, okay? Prayer, fasting, reading the word, getting with other believers and worship because when the time comes, we want to be strong enough to stand in the face of persecution. And these temptations, these temptations through the dragon as he changes up into a dragon, this is how the enemy works. This is how he works. He comes into you like a snake, like a serpent, like he did with Eve. And then he comes to you all of a sudden like a dragon. If he can, if he can win you over like a serpent, like a little, a cunning snake, he's going to try to kill you. And we see the example with Jesus Christ. In the wilderness, Jesus did not succumb and he did not, he did not worship the devil. He did not, he was not defeated in the wilderness through the subtlety of the snake, of the serpent. But then what, what did the devil do? He said, I, I got to kill him. I'm going to crucify him. I'm going to get him killed. But not knowing that by killing Christ, what he just did was he freed us from bondage of sin and death. Now we have eternal life. That was Jesus's mission was to die for us. And he resurrected. That's why the devil is defeated. But we have to fight battles. We have to win battles. There's going to be battles in our life. While he's a defeated foe, we still have to appropriate the victory of the cross in our lives in different areas. And that's different for everybody. That looks different for me, for my wife, you know, for Sister Samara, for Brother David. We have to appropriate the victory of the cross through the blood of Jesus in our lives. And let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, he is going to turn into that dragon again. It's going to happen. It's happening very slowly. Very slowly, but it's going to come to a head. And I would, I would encourage all of us to get closer to Jesus now more than ever. So when the time comes where we have to make a stand, when the dragon, he's inspiring the world governments of the world to persecute the true church, that we can make a firm stand and not renounce our faith, no matter what it's going to cost us. So thank you for listening in today. Thank you for joining us. I, I believe that this is one of the most important teachings that we should be teaching in the body of Christ to get ready, to ready ourselves for, for persecution, for difficulties, but to stand firm and have the joy of the Lord even in the difficult times. And I'll leave you with this. Remember Paul in the book of Philippians? He was in jail and he was still telling the Philippian church to rejoice, to rejoice in persecution rejoice so i want to thank you for coming in on this call thank you on uh, facebook and youtube if you're watching and we're going to be doing our last week week four we're going to bring it all together we're going to use a lot more pictures a lot more verses to just break down what we've been going through if the devil cannot force you or entice you to sin against your body against jesus he's going to try to persecute you so you can renounce your faith to see if you really want this world more than the Lord himself and his kingdom. Rest assured, we are in this warfare together. God bless you and see you next week. All right. Praise the Lord. I'm going to start in order and we're going to stop this video right now. All right.